In the 1970s, during a state visit to France, the Chinese leader Zhou Enlai was asked what he thought had been the main consequences of the French Revolution of 1789. He replied by saying, it was far too early to tell you. In some ways, the whole history of the modern world since the French Revolution can be seen as a series of reactions and counter-reactions to it, or ripples in a pond. We're at some distance from the revolution now, despite what Joe and Lai said, but certainly through the first part of the 19th century, the large-scale uh, political framework, if you like, very much a series of reactions to uh, the French Revolution, and then reactions to the reaction. By the time Napoleon was finally defeated on June the 18th, 1815, powers that would determine France's future and lay down its new constitutional law, had already gathered in Vienna at the Congress of Vienna. The Congress of Vienna was really run by Metternich, the Chancellor of the Austrian Empire, who was an extreme uh, reactionary. The, the whole tenor of the Congress of Vienna was to restore the Ancien Regime, the pre-revolutionary regime, as much as possible in France and across Europe, uh, because the Napoleonic Wars had had the effect, particularly in Germany, of spreading what Metternich called the virus, the disease of nationalism across the continent. Now, this uh, virus or disease really was potentially deadly for the Austrian Empire because, it, well, it was later known as the Prison House of Nations. It was a multinational multi-racial empire with uh, Serbians, Romanians, Czechs, Poles, Germans, Italians, ruled under uh, under the name of the um, Habsburg emperors and in the name of the Catholic Church, the Habsburg emperors of, of this Austrian multinational empire, which spread all the way from uh, Italy through to Poland, was uh, officially the Holy Roman Empire. It was a kind of Catholic version of the ancient Roman Empire. Now, eventually, in 1914, the First World War, just leaping way ahead in history, uh, one of the main causes of that conflict was the nationalism within the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Habsburg Empire. But uh, in 1815, Metternich was still trying to keep the lid on this volcano and suppressing all these nationalities. During the Napoleonic Wars, uh, during the occupation of Italy, and Germany and some of the Austrian uh, lands uh, by Napoleon, uh, the idea of nationalism had been deliberately fostered by the French Republican army. Remember, the French Revolution had been carried out in the name of the people, Tsar, the Austrian Emperor, the Prussian Emperor, and the English altogether. And their ambition at the Congress of Vienna was to restore the monarchy uh, in France and to restore the Catholic Church to a position of preeminence, and at the same time to suppress Poland, which had uh, previously been conquered by Russia, Prussia, and Austria, and divided between them. Uh, during the, the form of uh, Polish independence that had been established by Napoleon, that was now abolished, and this uh, great country of Poland again recolonized. Um, that was always going to be unstable. The Poles uh, never acquiesced in that. There were rebellions and the three emperors would assist themselves in suppressing any nationalistic uprising or indeed in suppressing any type of liberal uh, tendency, liberal movements, uh, democratizing movements. The three empires of Prussia, Russia and Austria all the way up to 1914 uh, remained as very reactionary uh, monarchies. Uh, Metternich. The uh, Prince Metternich, the, the effective power uh, in Austria, was famous for his system of spies, of secret police uh, everywhere throughout uh, the prison house of nations, as it became to be known, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Germany at this time at the Congress of Vienna is still divided up into many, many little feudal type principalities. If you know the, the, the fairy tales of the uh, Grimm brothers, you know, Rapunzel and it, this is the world of all these lots and lots of princes who turn into frogs and everything. There's lots and lots of German princes all over the place in these tiny little countries. Uh, Bavaria is one of the larger ones. Um, uh, Hesse, uh, Schleswig, Holstein, and so on. Uh, during the Napoleonic era, um, a nascent German national state had been formed. They called the Confederation of the Rhine. 
Uh, it had a liberal constitution uh, during, uh, but after the Congress of Vienna, um, those progressive tendencies are rid of, and this little patchwork of German states is a confederation that's essentially under Prussian rule, and eventually later in the 19th century, after 1871, becomes the German Empire, which is really a Prussian Empire in all but name. So you've got the Prussian Empire, which is almost Germany, you've got the Austrian Empire, and you've got the Russian Empire, and they run the whole of Europe. France obviously has been downgraded as a power because of the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo. England is a reactionary power after Waterloo. Prime Minister is the Duke of Wellington, who had been the military leader. He is a Tory, highly repressive. His milieu, his political constituency, is the landed aristocracy. Him, he himself is a landed aristocrat. Tory party at this time is the political expression of the power of the landed aristocracy who'd grown rich uh, as a result of the Corn Laws, the import duties that had kept English corn very, very expensive. Wellington is famous for remarking that the British Army were the scum of the earth. They were just sort of rural trash that he'd uh, been able to put into uniform uh, and it was the brilliant generalship of himself and the officer class of the British Army that, that had won the war. He's famous for saying that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the rugby fields, the playing fields of Eton. Duke of Wellington was an incredibly reactionary figure. He opposed railway building on the grounds that it would enable the working classes to move about but also that it would just interrupt the kind of genteel nature of rural life, making sort of smoke and noise and so on. Very, very pro-agricultural. Think of stately homes of a semi-feudal type of agricultural production on, uh, on great estates. Not mechanised agriculture, so, you know, in some ways the English peasantry, such as it was, would would rather like a figure like Wellington. They'd, they'd doff their cap to him. But by 1820, they didn't like him at all because aristocratic um, farm estates were being mechanised. The farm workers were being impoverished. And there was what amounted to a period of war countryside between the dispossessed small farmers and former farm workers who were now unemployed, destitute, heading for the workhouses, starving to death, being forced to migrate. And the gentry culminated in the fall of Wellington in the year 1830 uh, as a result of the swing riots, as they were known. I'll say a little more about 1830 and the swing riots later on. The other main character at the Congress of Vienna uh, sitting there representing the English alongside the Dry Geiserbund, the three reactionary emperors, was Castlereagh. Uh, Castlereagh is another incredibly reactionary figure. Castlereagh, who mobilised the yeomanry. The yeomanry were rich landowners and middle-ranking landowners who were organised into what we would now call paramilitary type formations on horseback with swords. Um, this was in the age before police force, so the countryside was policed by the yeomanry. These were the armed gentlemen farmers. The same people would also be the magistrates sitting in, on the bench in the local magistrates' court, and they saw themselves as protecting themselves against vagabonds or tinkers, as they were known throughout the country. These were ex-small farmers who'd lost their farms because of taxation. They were itinerant, large gangs of itinerant people, a bit like gypsies. They would 